So, good morning, guys. Uh, as high school students, we're all insanely busy. There are chapters to read, homework assignments to complete, practices to go to, and clubs to participate in. On top of that, I'm sure many of you here today are interested in science and possibly even going to college. I bet you tried talking to people about how you can pursue your passions, but you never got a clear answer on what you can do. I solved this problem in my life by doing research. Now, I know there's a lot going on, and it might seem like I'm trying to add stress by suggesting this activity, but trust me when I say that doing research is worth your time and effort. I'm here to share my story to convince you of this fact, and also tell you the steps that you can take to get these opportunities. So let me start off by asking you guys a question. How many people here have fallen asleep in class? <laughs> School does this to a lot of people. So it's become more common these days. I've done it too. In fact, a recent survey found that three out of four high school students in the United States are bored with classroom instruction. Specifically, they aren't satisfied with the way science is being taught in their schools. And why is this? It's boring because it's all theoretical. We can't experience science in action, and learning gets to the point where we're just memorizing information for an upcoming test. But through research, learning science can actually be cool. Let me give you an example. Here's probably what would happen in the classroom. Okay, class, get out your notebooks. We're going to have a lecture today. Mm -hmm. Sodium bicarbonate and acetic acid undergo a two-step reaction that produces sodium acetate and carbonic acid. Carbonic acid then rapidly decomposes into water and, water and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has a molar mass greater than the average molar mass of the air around it and sinks to the bottom of an open container. The carbon dioxide from the reaction could theoretically be used to extinguish an open flame. All right. Most of you either tuned me out, didn't care what I just said, or didn't understand what I said. But what if you can experience this in action? So I have a little experiment set up to show you just that. So here I have five candles. What I'm going to do is take baking soda and vinegar, baking soda, and uh, combine them together. And you're going to get the typical reaction that you expect when you combine baking soda and vinegar. It's that whole paper mache volcano experiment that you probably did when you were younger. So when I combine the vinegar with the baking soda, we're going to get a rapid reaction. And it's going to explode in the way that you might think. But you'll probably see something that you might not expect. It's not the way. So what just happened? Remember the reaction I was talking to you about? Sodium bicarbonate and acetic acid? It's really baking soda and vinegar. When they combine, they produce CO2, carbon dioxide. What happens is the CO2 sinks to the bottom of the beaker, so although it looks like all the air is escaping, the CO2 is really there. You can then use that to extinguish a flame because a flame needs oxygen in order to burn. So you can see how I could pour the CO2 over the candles and actually extinguish them. So this is just a small example, but in research, you can actually get your hands dirty and be a part of doing science. You can have fun, and at the same time, learn more than you ever could have in a traditional classroom setting. This is not to mention all the cool and expensive equipment that you get to play around with, which most people won't even see in their lifetimes. So now you're probably asking, all right, this was fun, but you got this crazy kid up here playing with candles. How does that benefit me? So let me ask you a question. How many people here like money? Lots of money. Like $10,000 worth. <laughs> so, two years ago, I was sitting in an audience very similar to this one at the Congress of Future Medical Leaders. I was hearing all these young speakers talk about their accomplishments and what they achieved, and all these crazy ideas and dreams about my future, but I didn't know what I could do to get there. So, I heard someone talk about research, and I decided to look into it further. I got my first internship later that year. And that sort of started it all out for me. I then conducted my own work in melanoma diagnostics, figuring out a new way to diagnose it. 
and submitted my work to a competition sponsored by the Congress. The very next Congress, I was on stage, presenting to 8,000 students I won a $10,000 medical school scholarship. But it didn't stop there. I was then selected for a prestigious New Jersey State Summer Science Program, the Governor's School in the Sciences. I received another paid research internship this time, the next year, and now I'm on this stage speaking to you today. When I think about it right now, it blows my mind. I was just a normal student sitting in class two years ago. I didn't expect any of this to happen. But research for me was like a domino effect. It opened up so many doors and so many opportunities, and I know that it'll change your life in ways that you might not even expect. Now you're probably wondering, why would a lab want you? There's so many smart graduate students and undergrads that know so much more than high school kids. But believe it or not, you add something very important to the work that any lab is doing. You don't know all the complicated science, which allows you to come in and think practically, instead of completely scientifically when problems arise. Have you ever taken a test and there's that one problem that you overthink? Like you sit there for so long, connecting random pieces of information to get to a solution, and it's like the furthest thing from the truth. And then you get the test back a few days later and you realize the answer was simple and obvious and staring you right in the face. Well, this happens to the genius scientists in the lab as well because they get so caught up in the science that they don't see the simple problems. But you have this ability to just come in and see the obvious, the things that they might not see. Maybe it's a broken gauge which causes the instrument to fail, a loose cap which causes the experiment to fail, or my personal favorite, the machine just wasn't plugged in. <laughs> Trust me, it's happened. Big research institutions, the machine just wasn't plugged in. Like, it's unbelievable. What happens if a lab doesn't want you? I know it might seem like it, but it's not the end. Let me tell you a story. There's a man that goes by the name of Sean Corey Carter, and he couldn't get anyone in the world to consider his work. He had all these dreams and goals about his future, but no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't get anyone to listen to him. In fact, it got so bad that he was living out of his car. But he said, forget the people. Forget what they think. And he brought his work to the world himself. You probably know him as Jay-Z. It's true. No record label would sign him. So he went out and created Rockefeller Records, which is now a music powerhouse. On top of that, he's a multimillionaire, he's a music icon, he's married to Beyonce, and he's just named as one of the most influential people in the world. In research, if no one offers you anything, you can always start your own investigation. You just have to have the curiosity to learn more, and the drive to keep on going, even if failure gets in the way. Use the internet. Put a proposal together. Some of the greatest projects that won the Google, Intel, and Stephen Science Fair biggest science competition in the United States, started out that way. In fact, my own work with melanoma started that way. I didn't have the resources of a big research institution behind me. Rather, I had the curiosity to learn more about this cancer, and when I figured out how it was being diagnosed, I saw fundamental flaws. The current way is an excisional biopsy, and doctors are missing a lot of these cases because patients aren't inclined to have someone rip off a piece of their skin. So I thought, what if there's a better way we could diagnose melanoma? I started reading articles, and I came across something interesting, how dogs could actually smell melanoma patients. I was intrigued by this idea, so I looked into it further, and figured out that this was because of something called volatile organic compounds, which the tumor was producing. So I said, what if we could initiate a reaction with these compounds, and create a visual test for the doctor to see? Did work in that field, and currently I'm looking into the use of volatile organic compounds, as well as tumor surface antigens, in order to create this visual test. There's always opportunities, you just have to have the initiative to reach out and take it yourself. So, maybe I've convinced you and you're at the point where you want to do research and you believe that you can do it. Now what? I want to give you some tips on how you can get these opportunities. So you want to start by finding a professor or faculty member that's doing work in a field that's interesting to you. Or maybe they're associated with the research program that you want to apply to. Go on the university website and look at their faculty profile. See what work they're doing what classes they're teaching, what recent publications they might have. Pick a select few that stand out to you, ones who you really think you could work with. Read up further on them and figure out why they're passionate about what they do. This will be very important when you contact them later. After that, email them, but make sure you take an indirect route. And I can't stress indirect enough. If I went up to someone and I was like, Hi, my name is Richard, I'm a high school student, I love science, now I have a research opportunity. You know, I'm crazy, and turn me down right there. Instead, email them about how you found the work interesting, what your future goals are, and how that relates to the work that they're doing. Then you can ask them, can we meet in person, and talk further about the topic, 
as well as the institution that they teach at. The goal here is to create a connection to the point where the person believes in you. They can help you find research even if they can't directly offer it. So let me give you a story from my life. Dr. Robson, bald guy that you see here, he couldn't offer me, he was a person I connected with at Rutgers. He couldn't offer me any research directly, but he decided he would help. I was applying to a program at Liberty Science Center at the top of your screen, a summer research internship program, but I needed some help getting in. Dr. Robson knew a friend at the Environmental Health Sciences Institute, the institute at the bottom of your screen. And he told him how he had this motivated high school student that was looking for research. His friend submitted an open research internship position to the Libby Science Center program. So I ended up getting into the program and getting paired with his lab. There's always connections. You just have to find the right people that set you up for success. When you make your approach, make sure you ask a lot of questions. Have you ever been in class and there's that one kid that asks so many questions? Like he just keeps going on and on and on and, on, and like he just never ends? Well, one thing's for certain, teachers never forget kids like that. I mean, whether it be positive or negative, I won't go into that. But they're always in the back of their minds. In the same way, when you approach a professor, ask a lot of questions about their work. Not only will this help them remember you better, but it'll keep the conversation going, and you'll have meaningful topics to talk about. And this is important, considering the fact that professors get hundreds of emails daily from other students, faculty members, and their own research departments. So in order to stay in their minds, you will have to be respectful but persistent. Follow up with them and keep on applying pressure because that's the only way they know that you're serious. Finally, don't be afraid of rejection. And this is a message you can take out of context of just the science. I want you to look around this room today and pick out five people at random. Five people. If you talk to every single person in this room today, chances are that only those five people would reject you. Studies have shown that out of the hundreds of interactions that we have daily, the average rejection rate is only five to seven people. I mean, it's amazing. We talk to so many people a day, but we're scared of rejection because of how it makes us feel the first time that it happens. But statistically, we have nothing to worry about. Things will happen if you keep asking questions and pushing hard. And if a professor says no, don't be scared of going to the next one. The odds are in your favor. To those in science, I spent the last 10 minutes or so talking to high school students, inspiring them to get involved with science, or at least hopefully. But this only works if those in the science community, the people that run the labs, the people that have power, give these students the opportunity to do research. Science can't be treated as a commodity, reserved to the few that can afford it, or the ones that have a certain degree. The youth are hungry for the opportunity to showcase their talents and abilities, and the barriers need to be removed so that they can get involved. They have the crazy and creative ideas that can change the world, but need access to the science to make them a reality. Give them a chance to pursue their ideas and the resources they need to recognize their dreams. And finally, to the students, continue to pursue your passion, whether that be science, music, art, whatever it is. Challenge yourself to go past what you think you're capable of, and stay curious. No matter what you do in life, there are going to be people that support you and those that exist just to tear you down. Correct. They might be older adults, people that you once respected, your peers, or even your friends. So I advise you, find the right group, the right friends, the right support, and the right guidance so you're never afraid of pursuing something that you love. Don't listen to the people that tell you no or the people that tell you you're not capable. Mm -hmm. There will be times where they'll shut the door on you and it'll be easy to feel disappointed, and you will feel disappointed. But use that as motivation to achieve success and prove them wrong. Yes. Stay committed to what you want to do and never give up. You will encounter failure and frustration, I absolutely guarantee it. But I'm only 17 and I can tell you it's worth it in the end. Thank you guys. Thank you.